Let me talk. Okay, doctor. It's okay now. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening. This is uh, Anis talking to you from Singapore. Uh, and uh, I hope you're having some unhappy COVID times and but staying safe. So today's topic uh, is um, kindly sponsored by uh, the free synthesis from j and And the topic is based on chest wall. So you can have different kinds of dysfunction to the chest wall. It can happen in the form of trauma. It can happen in the form of congenital abnormalities, or it can happen in the form of cancers, which needs resection and then reconstructions. So we have two very good speakers today who have been uh, in this uh, forefront and they have done a lot of uh, courses and conferences on this topic. So first speaker will be Padun Kiat. He's from the Bangkok Hospital. He's a, you, all of you are in the ASEAN region are familiar with, with him. He's been part of the chest wall reconstruction course for trauma and uh, cancer. So Padun Kiat will go first. He will talk on uh, chest wall reconstruction and trauma. The spec second speaker will be Dr. Nar Simon who is the head at the Ministry of Health you are in uh, University of Malaysia. Uh, he's got a lot of publications on chest wall reconstructions following cancers and other diseases. So he will be talking second on chest wall reconstructions. So the first half, Padun Kiat, please go ahead. Thank you, Luganese, for the warm introduction. Um, it's my honor again. It's my second time here um, uh, with all of the expeditious attendee, I would say. Everyone has some experience already. Um, so I would start my slides. Hold on. Oops. Zoom, share screen. Okay. All right. So um, my topic is a chest wall repair and reconstruction in traumatic scenario. Let me. Okay. All right, uh, I have no relevant disclosure. And all you know, we, I think you you all famili familiar with this, this kind of uh, situation, right? In Southeast Asia, teenager, motorcycle, without any protection and um, very dangerous. And in Thailand, we actually ranked first in road traffic death in 2017. And you can see the other countries mostly are from South Africa. So that, that means something that it, the situation is very bad in Thailand. So with uh, blunt injury, uh, especially in chest injury, it's a uh, rib fracture accompany about 20 to 25% of that. Actually, it's the most common injury in the blunt chest. And it's associating with a pneumohemothorax contusion secretion obstruction and neurovascular internal organ injury. So I would start with the rib anatomy. So rib itself, it's a, it's a thin bone, total thickness is only eight to 12 millimeter, and the cortex only one millimeter thick, and the soft, and the, its bone marrow is very soft. So if you want to go with the uh, traditional screw and plate, it does not hold it very well. But however, it's, uh, there's a lot of blood and nutrient supply from the periosteum. So just to make sure when you want to fix it with the metal plate, you need to keep the periosteum in touch. And it's thick and not approximately thin and wide distally and it rotates along its course. So for the bio biomechanics of ribs, you can see that it, look at its elasticity when you put a load into the to the ribs, it can flex a lot. So um, when you try to fix the rib, you need to account the, it's, bio, their, it's biomechanics too. And each of the ribs has different thickness, curvature and size. First to third rib is actually pretty thick and the angle of its core is very acute. So, um, and the latest recommendations, they do not recommend fix first to third rib anymore only a very selected case. But the fourth to 10, um, four to 10 rib, it uh, does not has a very acute angle like, like the, the, first, the, the first three ribs. So it makes the fixations uh, more likely to be work. And um, you need to know that it's proximal fixation is on the cartilage. So when you want to fix something on the cartilage, you might want to fix on the sternum instead. And for this, this whole fixation will be a transferred process. 
and um, the you know the chest move a lot. It we breathe approximately uh, twenty to thirty thousand times a day. So each each breath cause pain in the rib fracture. So and um, more important the than the displacement of the ribs and the fracture itself, the pulmonary complication it's it's what we're really concerned about. Okay. And flail chest, it's a segmental fracture in the three consecutive ribs, and it causes impaired respiratory mechanics, and it causes the underlying pulmonary contusion. And with that, with that contusion, the patient is very high risk to turn into the NRTS. And consequently, we cannot rid him of the ventilator. So mortality and mobility of the rib fracture is not from the rib fracture itself. It always, uh, it is the, always the phrase that I'm talking to my patient, but it is rather from the pulmonary complications. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a paper from a trauma showing that a direct thoracic injury was the strongest predictor of a trauma induced ARDS, right? So it's, um, for the polytrauma in, involving thoracic, it is very important to consider what's going on to the patient in terms of ARDS. And the ARDS, its onset, its median time is about three days. It can happen as early as one day, and it can happen as late as six days. So if you want to do some major surgery for this um, this poly polytrauma patient, you need to consider to delay as much as possible. Uh, this is from the, the paper from trauma, but in the latest, a, a consensus uh, this year from Las Vegas, they might say it's differently. I'll show you a little bit later. And the, the associated condition, human pneumothorax, um, you need a large chest tube and um, and if it's a large mouth, it will say it's mandatory to put the tube. And if it's a small mouth, sometimes you may avoid the tube, but unless you want to go to do some other procedure, like orthopedics, that you will need the tube procostomy. And um, I, I would always, when, when the patients are referred to me with a chest tube, to make sure that the chest tube is in a good position, not in a fissure, not in the basal area, if there's a pneumothorax, so to make sure that it drains everything well. And, and now with the digital thoracic drainage, um, it's really helped us a lot in terms of measurement and in terms of suctioning. And um, with the patient who have the lung contusion or a detector it's, it's a sign of the high level of impact. So be careful to watch for the ARDS. And um, this is very, very important in, for my patient. I would say um, when, when you want to treat the patient with a pneumothorax, it's A, B, C, D, right? So first, to make sure that the patient has a patent airway. With a patient who have who are very high, heavy smoker, um, with the refractor, they're very at risk to have a secretion obstruction. So some of the patient, even though they're not intubating, but if they cannot clear the sputum out by day one or two, I would electively put the tube in and do the bronchoscopy. And sometimes I just um, put the tube in for one to two days to make sure that we can clear his airway up and extubate on day three. And some of the patient may not need anything else at all. They just need uh, the procedure for airway and procedure for pain. All right, um, this is a nice uh, paper from, from US. They have the rib fracture management protocol. This is not things about the, rib, the surgical fixation, all right? It's just they are focusing on, on the pain, inspiration, and cough. So if the, their peak score is it's low, it means that the patient has a very severe physiologically um, impaired of, of, of their breathing, of their function. So they would um, do some procedure, they would do something else if the score is low. And they're focusing, they focus on the pain and respiratory. So you can see there's a, there's a list of things that they're doing a pain, in terms of pain. They're giving them a patient's multimodality. They're giving them the, the um, 
the regional anesthesia and they have the res respiratory therapist come and see them an hour upon an admission to make sure that they can clear the airway. And it's six hours upon the acute care patient. So you can see that uh, um, the factors of the image I show you, some look very severe. You see the uh, multiple flail segment posteriorly. Actually, this patient has 11 flail segment of the fracture. Or this one has a flail segment of third to seventh rib. This one has a severe um, deformity of the first to fourth ribs. But not, not all of this patient, I fixed them. So some, only some, I fixed them. So, so very important when you want to treat the patient in chest trauma, you don't focus only on the chest wall fixation, but you need to make sure that the airway, the pleural drainage, and the pain control is okay. This is the, my, I think this is the key point of my talk. All right, so now we were talking about the fixation. So uh, who, would, who would we fix? There's a, a, a paper, a pretty, pretty old, that's showing that when the, in the patient who is older than 65 years old, they're at risk, at higher risk of developing complications such as pneumonia or death. And when there's more than six segments of fractures, the mortality increased significantly. All right. So the more the the more the fractures, the more complications can can happen. All right. So how would you how would you fix it? So I would you, I would starting with the historic instrument that we used before the internal pneumatic fixation. This is a professor Philip Drinker. He invented the Drinker respirator um, back in 19, uh, 1928. And these two are um, Dr. Bennett and Dr. Bird, and he's a uh, famous anesthesiologist who invented those ventilator and, and then developed to very modern ventilator that we are using right now. So, but, um, but we know that uh, internal, uh, uh, internal fixation can help somewhat, but not in the long term, because we don't want to intubate the patient for too long. And the, Iron lung from the Dringer respirator is not compatible with life and is not good for ambulation. So for the fix, surgical fixation, we started with a like a Cape, Cape Town limpet. It's like a plunger, sink plunger. You, you put it on a patient, you suck it up, and you keep it on a metal bar. And then they use some hook, they use some clamp on sternum, they use some troca with board using skewer for interior chest, and then use a a wire, um, intermediary wire, and and then hold it with external wire. And um, in the modern time, uh, firstly, Doctor um, Tanaka he had a randomized control trial. I would talk about it a little bit later on Judas Strat. It, it, it worked pretty well, but as you know, it's, it's a, a, um, it, a straight metal bar and with the coverage of the ribs, sometimes not, it does not work very well in the long segmental fracture. And then Dr. Kushner, he's a orthopedic surgeon. He developed a uh, K-wire, Kushner wire. And um, they're, they've been used for the refraction for some time, but uh, no complication is a wire myclation and a wire cutout. So challenges in the refraction in the past, even though we know in the flail chest patient, refraction help in terms of less time in intubation, less mortality, less pneumonia, but it's not popular because it's very challenging due to its anatomy. Um, thin cortex, very hard to fix, highly flexible and highly um, twisted and conical. So um, then um, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, there's a, a nice paper from Dr. Bartlum. He, um, he showed that um, they, we call it anatomical metal bar. 
from the metric strip on, on both left side and right side that can fix the ribs in anatomical fashion. All right. So when to fix? What are the evidence? Um, there's only five level two evidence so far, globally. So the, 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 the evidence for the liquid fixing is not that much yet. Um, we started from 2002, the first randomized controlled trial from Dr. Tanaka. Um, they, he, he used a, a um, Judas, Judas Strat and, and compared to ventilator alone and uh, the pneumonia rate uh, reduced significantly as well as the ventilator time, ICU time, and return to work time. So all of this parameter um, is significantly different. And then Dr. Gretzny, he used the cushion a while, K while, said again, um, the, uh, compared to the conservative group and surgical group, uh, the ventilating time, ICU pneumonia, chest deformity is very significantly different. But uh, he there was no uh, uh, data on the long-term viral complication and the, the rate of wound infection of amidiacinate is pretty high. And then um, Dr. Marasco, if, if some of you have experience on the rib fixation, you would know that she is the person who is leading the, the world of um, rib fixation right now. She used a matrix rib and compare um, of surgical and non-surgical group in frail rib fractures and um, and she uh, the ICU stay pneumonia tracheostomy and length of stay is reduced. And then there's couples of paper coming from um, from China showing the same result. Okay, Dr. Liu and Dr. and Dr. Wu. So. Um, overall, in flail rib fractures, um, it, it's the surgical stabilization of rib fracture is recommended when it's over five segments and it's reduced length of stay and all of these parameters I just told you. And, but what about the multiple rib fractures without flail shears? Is there any evidence? No randomized control trial at this point. They, they were, there are two ongoing trials, um, fixed con and series non randomized control trial. I think it would take about a couple of years and, and, and we know the result. But um, there are some retrospective trial that uh, compare surgical and non-surgical group and it shows that uh, mostly pain and social functioning it's uh, better in surgery group. So this is a, a guideline that was uh, published from the Cheswell Injury Society early this year, January 2020. Um, and uh, for everyone who interested in the refractor, I would recommend uh, you go and read it. It's, it's open online, everyone, uh, it's, it's open access. So um, the, the algorithm is that, so any refractors to do CT chest, to assess respiratory function and you give the multi-modality pain control and local regional pain control and without any contraindications such as chalk, severe trauma brain injury, traumatic brain injury, MI or fracture outside rib um, 3 to 10, for example 1 to 2 or um, the falling rib of 12 to 11, um, you go to see the, this criteria here, chest wall instability. And if they're yes, and um, there's no other higher priority injury like um, abdominal injury or long bone injury, and you can go fix them ideally less than 74 hours. Why do I say that? Because I think um, uh, they ruled out a polytrauma patient already. You see this. They ruled out shock ongoing resuscitation. They ruled out the QM, the heart problem, the brain problem already. So their, their recommendation now is as soon as possible, 
some would fix it in day one if they only a chest trauma. Okay, and without the chest valve instability, they look at ventilator, they look at displacement of the rib fractures, they look at the pulmonary derangement or an, um, failure to wean on ventilator, all of these parameter. And if, um, if, if there's a yes, yes here, you, you go for the SSRF. Uh, this is a, a guideline in our center. So if there's a hemothorax, you go, uh, you wait three days. If the uh, x-ray is not clear, you consult um, a thoracic surgeon and you may need uh, a, a vast or refixation. Same thing with pneumothorax. So this is our algorithm of the refixation. We just follow um, the, that, those guidelines. Pretty much the same thing. So um, this is a, an, an example of the case. This is a seven, he was a 74 gentleman has a car accident and, and another passenger death on scene. So it means that the, the mechanics, mechanism of injury is pretty high. He had blunt chest and head injury. He was at a survey and resuscitation at another country, intubated, need nine units of blood, and uh, he flew by helicopter to Bangkok and had a multiple fractures, blunt abdominal injury, head injury, and flail shares on the left side, second to seventh, right side, second to seventh, and also the sternal fracture. So uh, there's a ret retained blood cut. So I did a uh, vast exploration blood cut removal on day three. This is the severity of the fracture. On the left side, you can see a uh, uh, very de deformed um, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Also on the right side. So um, we stabilized him, and um, he once he's okay. And now we're trying to wean him off ventilator on day eight. Mm -hmm. but he was unable to do that due to a severe pain and also on the right side still had the air leaking out. So, did, so we, we brought him to the operating theater, did the right vest and you can see there's a um, the lung injury. So we um, removed that segment by the stapler and we looked into the chest and you can see there is a, there were a there were floating rib segment and and you know uh, rib fractures heal by um, confined in the pleura and the the opposition of the ribs so once you see this there's no way that a rib fracture can heal by itself so we fixed um, once we're done with VAS, we made a um, thoracotomy going uh, with, uh, to the ribs and then fix them with the matrix rib. Um, the, the, fi the surgical fixation part actually it's, it's pretty straightforward. I believe any one of you um, with only one case experience, you would be able to do that because uh, it's of, of all thoracic surgeon doing thoracotomy exposure is pretty straightforward. And um, with the instrument, it, it, they make it very easy to do that. So I would just right, I'll skip this part. You, you fix uh, the plate with the ribs and, the, and then you're putting a um, screw um, and you fix them very easy. We might be able to hold another um, another cadaveric workshop um, it, or hopefully next year or, or no if if not in two years so if anyone interested you can come and join us and join us in Thailand so on the right side we fixed three ribs the 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 fourth rib is pretty high behind the scapula so we in 
um, improvised by doing the doing like a suture, like a body splint, and it's pretty stable at the end of the case. And on the on the left side, uh, we fixed um, four ribs, and we were able to win off to the TPS on the next day um, and extubate it on post-operative day three. The uh, second case, it's a 55-year-old gentleman had a road traffic accident, multiple um, right rib fractures with a flail chest, pneumothorax, and had, had a spinal fracture. Um, the spine team fixed him first. And um, on day five, he, he was not able to win off the ventilator. So we follow our guideline. And then, we brought him to the theater. And um, the other thing is that um, uh, he has a lot of pus in the, in the bronchus. So, so my protocol is that in the rib fracture case, if, I, if a patient is deemed to go to the operating theater, I'll start with a single lumen um, endotracheal tube. I did a toilet bronchoscopy first and asked the anesthesiologist to put in a blocker. Um, and then we return after we're done, we turn him to the to the lateral decubitus and and do the VATS and follow by the refixation. You can see a pass on the right lower lobe and right lower orifice, and we fix them. And we he were, we were able to bring him up until later in two days. The third case is a 53 year old gentleman, heavy smoker. Um, has electrical injury involved to uh, five, five meters and a hemothorax has ICD placed and, um, and the third to twelfth rib fracture it was not flail. So CT scan showed this that um, the lung is not expanded and you can actually see there's a secretion obstructed in his airway so what we did is we put another two, another ICD and we apply 40 centimeter of water suction and uh, the lung still partial expansion. So what do we do next? So um, with, with, uh, because of pain and, and we, uh, the incentive to spirometry, it's only um, uh, 150, C, 150 cc per minute. So again, we did a, an elective intubation. He was not um, required intubation at the beginning. He was able to breathe okay. But with that pain, with the secretion, I think this patient is at very, very high risk to developing the pulmonary complication. So I intubated him, did a bronchoscopy, and did a steroid injection at the fracture site. And we were able to extubate him the next day. And afterwards, um, and we are also the, um, the with, with the help of the regional anesthesia, the pain actually went down from 10 to 4. And we were able to wean him off um, oxygen on post injury day 3. And we, we removed the ICD and pull off day 5 and sent him to rehab center on day 6. Um, the fourth case, a 61-year-old gentleman, um, car accident, has a simple first rib fracture and frail second to eighth rib fracture, but posteriorly, posteriorly. And he had only isolated chest injury, no other um, system, no other uh, injury at other system. So, um, the CT scan shows his, his lung is it's a very atelectatic, has some effusion. Um, this is the severity of his fracture. You can see fail and collapse, severe displacement. Um, and very painful. Um, uh, had the, for the incentive spirometry, only one balsa. So, but since it's a posterior part, it's um, it's hard to fix all the lines and it's pretty stable in the back, right, with all the muscle. So we started with a thoracic epidural analgesia, and with that the pain went down significantly. 
and we were able to wean him off oxygen on post injury day six and the the, the incentive spirometry up two balls which is at his goal so and uh, we did not do anything at all so in two months he has no pain issue uh, spirometry at 90 percent at goal so with this i want to, i want to emphasize that um the first well in the first the most important procedure for refractor is not a surgical refixation is a surgery procedure for airway and then do you drain the pleura properly control the pain and then you think about the refixation okay what, are you, what about the future of the SSRF? There's a lot of um, instrument in the market down the road, uh, the many ways to fix that on the side, anterior to posterior. So um, um, there's a lot to coming on the market. Uh, what about vats? You know, right? We, we, we want to preserve the patient function, so we fix the rib. But in order to do that, we did we 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 do a thoracotomy, and thoracotomy you cut the muscle of chest wall, the muscle of respiratory function. Sometimes you you even cut the 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 origin of the serratus, right? So um, if we can do it through fat, is it better? So there's a group um, um, from from US. They did a extra thoracic fats by they made a small incision, put in Alexis wound retractor, and um, they they did a ballooning of the submuscular space, and then they put a rib a, a plate and nail through that hole. But they need to use a meeple, of course. And the other groups, they did a intrathoracic vas. Um, um, they go through the vas using the meeple instrument, but um, they bend the curve um, the other way around that, um, that the company recommended. And I talked to, I, um, to the, the operator, it, it, it took six hours. So probably is not worth at this point. I think it's a instrument issue. So in the future, if the company can develop better instrument, I'm sure that uh, there will appeal a lot of surgeons to do the intrathoracic bats, like for example, like this. Okay, so in conclusion, ribs are curvature, flexible and highly mobile bones, which make them difficult to be fixed by the non-anatomical instrument. And pain and respiration is a major concern in rib fracture patients, even more than fracture himself. And in patients with a full chest, unable to wean off the ventilator, a surgical stabilization of rib fracture are recommended. And uh, multiple rib fracture without a full chest, it's an optional in selected patient, but more, more studies are required in, it's in the process. And procedure for airway, growth drainage, and pain control. I mean, the Tory to perform prior to consider SSRF. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kat, for that very detailed presentation. Uh, we'll take the Q&A at the end. I already have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, next speaker is Nara. I think, Nara, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'd like to share the screen. You, you have the control. Go ahead. Okay. Can you see my screen now? All right, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, uh, thank you Six for having me this evening uh, to discuss on chest wall resection and reconstruction for non traumatic scenario and will be mostly on tumors. And uh, I would like to also appreciate the sponsors, J&J uh, &J and Deficintis. Uh, let's get on, I have no disclosures except that all the pictures are shown from our database with appropriate consent to obtain from the patients and I received honorarium for this talk. Uh, this is an overview of my talk, a uh, bit of background, chest wall anatomy, common indications, biopsy and imaging, principles of resection and reconstruction, 
chest wall tumor group in HKL, the complications, surgery during the COVID era, and advancement in reconstruction. So let's get on with the uh, background. Uh, back in 1878, that's about 140 years ago, uh, Halden performed the first successful partial stenectomy. And in 1898, uh, Parham performed the first chest wall resection for tumor. In 1906, uh, Tanzini performed the first uh, myocutaneous flap for coverage of anterior chest wall after radical mastectomy. And he described it uh, uh, in, during that period. But until 1970 onwards, the flap options were better accepted after Mathes and Nahai defined the blood supply to several muscles and myocutaneous flaps. Uh, so if you have huge defects in the uh, chest wall, uh, you ought to get is lung herniations, uh, paradoxical breathing, uh, or scapular trapping. And that will require some form of uh, rigid reconstruction. And in determining what type of flap to use, it is actually determined by the size, location, and depth of the defect, viability of the surrounding tissue, and prior operative procedures. Uh, let's just go back to the basic chest wall anatomy. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, but I just like to highlight uh, the, the pectoralis major, the latissimus dorsi, and the serratus anterior are the three commonest muscles used uh, during any rotational flap. Uh, to uh, reconstruct the uh, anterior chest wall. And this is the posterior view of the extension of the serratus and latissimus dorsi. Uh, you also have the trapezius and rhomboidus, but these are rarely used for reconstruction. And more importantly is the rib cage itself. Uh, when you look at the anterolateral part of the rib cage, where if you recite this part, where you have the true ribs and the false ribs, they play a very important role during the inspiration of the breathing. When you see the anterolateral part of the rib actually rising up and down. So if any resection were done in this area, it's vital to reconstruct them. So that's the uh, key message that I would like to highlight in the anatomy slide. Uh, the indication for chest wall resection, as usual, you divide it to congenital disorders, infections or inflammatory trauma, neoplastic lesion. And uh, uh, we in HKL do not deal with congenital disorders because it's taken care of by the Pediatric Institute. Uh, the one, the rape arrows are the one that we have encountered so far. Uh, and uh, trauma is well discussed by Dr. Padunkia earlier, so I will leave that aside. And we will talk about tumors. So benign primary tumors, you have the whole list of them. We have encountered with the red arrows and the malignant ones is on the right. Uh, how, what about biopsy? FNA is adequate if the lesion is less than five centimeter. Uh, so, but we, we never got anything less than five centimeter in HKL. Most of our tumors are huge, 10 centimeters. And, and we normally go for incisional biopsy. And we normally include the biopsy inc uh, incision or the entry point within the future resection incision site so that you don't leave behind any. Uh, seedlings in the biopsy site. You can also uh, perform on-table frozen section to determine negative margin if there's any suspicious uh, macroscopic uh, appearance while you're doing the resection. Uh, for imaging, uh, we normally go ahead with a CECT scan with 3D recon, like what you see in the screen. Uh, MRI is performed for a, a selected cases, especially if the lesion is in the apical aspect of the uh, thorax uh, involving the brachial plexus or the sub uh, subclavian vessels. PET scan is always performed to make sure that the surgery is done in patients with no metastatic disease or at least with a, a oligometastatic that can be resected. So you don't want to do radical resection in patients with metastatic disease. You, want to, you can opt for palliative resection if it's at all necessary. The principles of resection, uh, it's preferable that the surgeon performing the resection should not be the surgeon responsible for reconstruction. And the tumor-free margin is most important in recurrent free survival. 
So it's recommended to have four to five centimeter of margin for primary chest wall tumor and about two to three centimeter for metastatic chest wall tumor. However, there's a caveat to this in huge mass when the margins can be limited by adjacent anatomy. For example, in this lady, she's got a right, uh, huge right anterior chest wall lesion with this CT scan appearance, pushing the uh, brachial plexus and subclavian vessels in the apical aspect. And we went on and resected this tumor. It's a malignant leiomyosarcoma of the anterior chest wall. We took out the proximal clavicle, the sternoclavicular head, part of the sternum, first to fourth rib, we dissected the subclavian artery successfully away, but the subclavian vein was going into the tumor uh, as evident by the pre-op assessment. We had to resect and reconstruct the subclavian vein and shave off the fat pad on the uh, brachial plexus to somehow achieve some sort of uh, uh, margin and apply clips in case if the margin is positive, radiotherapy can be applied. And using the same sample, the principle of reconstructions will be to obliterate dead space. So if, if this is the dead space, we need to figure out how to obliterate it. And when the lung expands, the dead space is taken care. We restore the chest wall rigidity by applying uh, titanium replates, preserve the pulmonary mechanic, protect the intrathoracic organs, provide soft tissue coverage by using a free flap, anterolateral tri free flap, minimize the deformity, and you allow the patient to receive adjuvant therapy if indicated with good reconstruction. And if you follow these principles, you'll have a happy patient at the end of the day and the adjuvant treatment can be carried out successfully. The reconstruction criteria, if you have anterolateral defect more than 5 cm, posterior defect more than 10 cm, subscapular region defect more than 7 cm, or a defect area of more than 100 centimeters squared, or if you have taken more than four ribs, some form of reconstruction is necessary. The, the options you have is rigid or non-rigid. In rigid, you have autologous drip translocation, rarely done, titanium rib plates, more commonly done, and uh, hydroxyapatite based 3D printed prosthesis is available in the market, expensive. If you have the fun to do, use it, by all means, it's better. It's, it's at the moment the best. And non-rigid flap, free flap or rotational flap, alloplastic materials, bioprocesses, all these is available to, to, at the disposal. But the surgeon and the team operating the patient must decide what is the right prosthesis to use to reconstruct the patient, taking into consideration their physical capabilities, the tumor pathology, the infective status, the nutritional status. And this is where the MBT comes in. It's very important. Ideal processes must be rigid enough to abolish paradoxical chest wall motion, malleable enough to uh, uh, allow appropriate contouring, physically and chemically inert, allows for tissue ingrowth, uh, radiolucent, sterile, resistant to infection and inexpensive. And most of the prostheses in the market could fulfill most of these criteria except the inexpensive part. No one likes to sell cheap processes. So that is yet to be achieved. And uh, these are the options for non-rigid reconstruction that's available, synthetic mesh, bioprosthetic materials. And we are familiar with nylon and polypropylene uh, mesh and bovine pericardiums. This is easily available in any center, I believe. And for rigid reconstruction, uh, there are a few options available. Uh, stratos, matrix rib, stainless steel bars, and we are familiar with matrix rib fixation. Uh, metal metaacrylate sandwich method, I know some surgeons swear by it, but if you give me an option not to use it, I'll choose that uh, because it's difficult to mold, toxicity, anchoring difficulty, fracture, all these uh, components are there, but it is an excellent material to reconstruct the sternum in a cheap way to do it. If you have nothing else available, this is the way to go. So because of increasing number of referrals, complex chest wall tumors, we had to form a group to organize these patients properly and plan them rightly. So today we have performed about 32 chest wall resections and reconstructions with a single mortality. The team consists of the anesthetists, oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, vascular surgeons, auto-oncologists, breast and endocrine surgeons, plastic and recon surgeons, and of course the thoracic team. So when a patient referred to us, the chest wall mass 
uh, we the chest bone mass, they come to us with CT scans and biopsy results with the cell block. And our pathologists will review the report and the cell block. And if they are happy, we will not repeat a biopsy, otherwise we do. And then they go undergo extensive preoperative workup. And once all this information is available, we'll call for an MDT and we decide to intervene or not to intervene. When we decide to intervene, the surgery is carried out. The first team, thoracic team usually will reset off the tumor and the second team, the plastic team will harvest the flap. Uh, sometimes this will happen simultaneously to save time. And once the resection is done and the flap is ready, the third team will go in to form the pedicle anastomosis. And then once the anastomosis is done with the flap dangling on the defect area, the thoracic team will go in and fix the uh, titanium rib, making sure that the pedicle is far away from the nearest titanium rib so that it won't get compressed or compromised. And once we fix the ribs, uh, the, the plastic team comes in again and uh, close the flap and the harbor site. And then the patient goes on extensive physiotherapy, nutritional optimization and adjuvant treatment planning if necessary. So this is how generally we work in settling the uh, chest wall tumor that we get uh, referral from. And we published our first 20 patients uh, in Indian General of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery recently. And um, um, most of the patients have got some form of comorbids. One of them even got hepatitis C. And the commonest tumor that we deal with, uh, sarcoma followed by breast cancer and phyllodus tumor. And we had two desmoid fibromatosis. Uh, the various rib reconstruction, uh, chest wall reconstruction methods that we apply based on the patient's suitability, the tumor pathology and the infective status. And uh, if you notice uh, the reconstruction method between the non-rigid and the rigid, the size of the tumor is pretty much the same. Uh, purely because we don't have a rule to decide that this set of patients will undergo rigid reconstruction and the other don't. Uh, there were three patients who actually required rigid reconstruction were decided not to go for rigid because of the infective status. The tumor was perforated, it passed and the base was infected as well. So there's no way you can put in a prosthesis. Decision was made for flap closure only. One of them died because of permanent sepsis a month later. All these three patients required tracheostomy after the resection. However, those who underwent rigid reconstruction had no post-op ventilation issues and they all were fine. Margins, we had three patients with microscopic margin involvement, four patients had local recurrence, one year survival was about 90% and one year disease-free survival was about 80%. And at the moment, we are com compiling uh, five-year data to be reported with more uh, details of uh, the reconstruction to be addressed in that uh, uh, reporting. So now let's, let me share some cases that we've performed. Uh, the first case will be of a sternectomy, a uh, 58-year-old man with tiny CA invasion of the sternum, upper lobe extension to the anterior chest wall. So we perform a partial stenectomy, left proximal clavicle resection, second, third, and fourth rib resection, the left side, wedge resection on the left upper lobe, with titanium rib cross plating and ALT free flap. So this is a recon of this gentleman. You can see the tumor is actually eroding away the proximal sternum, manubrium, and sternum. Uh, the second rib is gone, and the third rib is involved. And uh, this is after the resection. Uh, we've taken out the innominate vein because it's going into the tumor. Uh, the aortic arch is exposed, the trachea, the pedicle is from the inferior thyroid artery, which was dissected from the top. And uh, we cross-plated this patient to, to restore the chest wall rigidity. And uh, the flap was closed, he was extubated, went back to the ward. Uh, this is on day three of the surgery. And you can see the flap is already uh, being sunk uh, sucked in to the uh, between the uh, rib platings, uh, and he's well und underwent adjuvant treatment and he's doing well now. So this is another lady, a 27 year old lady with right sided thoracic abdominal wall liposarcoma, ruptured and infected, deemed not resectable in another center, and uh, she was uh, planned for palliative treatment, sent to our oncologist for uh, palliative uh, radiation. So our oncologist decided to bring her to the tumor group and 
we decided we may be able to help her. So we tried, uh, we, we decided to go on with the right trochlear abdominal resection, diaphragm and segment six and seven subcapsular resection, ALT free flat reconstruction only without any prosthesis because no looking at this kind of tumor infection, if I put a prosthesis in, I'm looking for trouble. So we just decided to put a free flat, ALT free flat was reconstructed and she, we, we did an on-table tracheostomy for her. Uh, this is her at one month of surgery. The tracheostomy was taken out on daytime. She went home. And this was how she came to us. We gave her some quality of life. She succumbed about 10 months later with recurrence to the mandible and to the brain. But she had good 10 months with good quality of life before she died. This lady is a 47-year-old lady, recurrent phyllodus tumor with rib invasion. Uh, so if you look at, there's a scar here. So what happened is that this lady was operated three times before she presented to us uh, in another center, knowing that it's a phyllodus tumor and no radical surgery was advised to her. So by the time she reached at this stage, the, the tumor has already invaded to the chest wall, going between the intercostals and involving the rib. So we did a left anterior chest wall resection uh, to keep taking out the ribs and having a red, uh, need to remove most of the uh, skin because if you can uh, appreciate the edema is going really high up, you're not sure if the margin is involved. And it's difficult to do frozen section on phyllodus. The, the, the pathologist will not be able to tell us accurately whether the margin is involved or not. So we need to go really radical. And we applied a, a rib plating across. You just need to put three plates here and an ALT free flat closure. And she was the fastest patient that went home. In day six, she was home and she celebrated Raya at home. Uh, she's doing all right. This is a complex case of a, a pico posterior uh, mass uh, hugging the first rib from the posterior. She's a 27 year old lady presented with a neck discomfort. The MRI showed the soft tissue mass hugging the first rib from the posterior. The biopsy showed desmoid fibromatosis. But being a doctor, she was uh, she she knows of the diagnosis. She read about it, and when she was offered just an excision biopsy, she wanted a second opinion, and she reached our hospital. Uh, so what we did after the MDT, we decided to go radical on her to prevent any recurrence. So she went for a, a left-sided scapular mobilization, posterior chest wall resection, titanium rib reconstruction, and ALT free flap. So we shaved out the subscapularis muscle off the scapula, rotated laterally to allow access to the posterior uh, chest wall, and we took the whole chest posterior side of aspect of the chest wall and mass up to the uh, rib. The only thing that limited us was again the superior aspect of the sub clavian vessels and the brachial plexus. So we had to shave off the fat pad and preserve the subclavian vessels. And uh, we took out first to six rib to make sure we get adequate clearance, reconstructed her and facial cutaneous uh, free flap from the anterolateral tie was used to cover. And she's now two years post-surgery uh, without any recurrence, we perform MRI every six months or to make sure that uh, there's no recurrence. Desmoid fibromatosis is notorious to recur. Um, there, there's another case that was referred uh, from another center where the surgeon performed the resection of the anterior chest wall with a uh, tumor without a prior biopsy. And that particular patient has got recurrence in almost encroaching the vertebral artery on the right side and when she was referred to us, it was too late that she was need to be subjected for forearm quadrantectomy. Uh, but the family members refused the morbid surgery. And at the moment, I'm not sure what's happening to that patient. So that's what fibromatosis, be sure radical surgery is planned and proper reconstruction is done. This is the last case that I'll be discussing with uh, we use double ALT free flap to reconstruct this gentleman. He's got a left-sided thoracoabdominal chondrosarcoma with infiltration to the spleen and a diaphragm. So we perform a left anterior chest wall resection. Uh, we took out uh, the lower three to, uh, th three to four ribs and uh, anterior third of the diaphragm. Splenectomy was performed and the entire abdominal walls was removed. The tumor weighed about 3.6 kilograms. 
and uh, I put in two ribs, the lower chest, because it's not really vital to uh, uh, in the respiratory breathing mechanics, just to protect the lung and to hitch hide the posterior third of the diaphragm to the lower part of the matrix rib. And then we applied two composite mesh uh, to totally isolate the thoracic content and the abdominal contents and two ALT flap was used to cover the defect. Uh, he went back home after about uh, 60 days in the ward because he had a complication around this area, the wound breakdown, exposing the uh, composite mesh but he was successfully treated with VAC dressing and SSG later. So he's home now, well, no recurrence after one year of surgery. So the complications we faced, flap failure in six patients, we had to re-explore them, but all flaps were salvaged. The titanium rib dislodged and infected in two patients, needed re-exploration. We cut half of the titanium rib and left the other half inside and we salvaged well. A remnant of the resected rib uh, compressed the flat vascular pedicle. Uh, we had to re-explore to release the vascular pedicle and further resect the remnant of the rib and protect the pedicle with proline mesh uh, to salvage the flat, salvaged and was done successfully. We had one death because uh, this is the death I was talking about earlier. He had coexisting chest wall tumor with communication with empyema, thoracis. He refused any surg surgical intervention for empyema for four years and then he noted the tumor growing about six months on his chest wall. We offered palliative resection and flap coverage because of the infection and also the tumor. Um, despite our attempts, he succumbed after a month of the surgery. So in COVID era, can we do chest wall resections? Uh, we have done it. Uh, we've published our experience during the heights of COVID in March to May to 2020. Uh, we performed over 44 procedures, but uh, we did three chest wall resections. And what we follow during this period of COVID is that we have to test all patients with RT-PCR method for COVID-19, observe patients for potential round resections, at least for one incubation period before surgery, and how all healthcare workers must don PPE and pro follow the procedures appropriately to prevent any cross infections. So thoracic surgery must continue during this era. And because COVID is going to be here for a long time, we can't stop helping these patients and we need to continue uh, doing this surgery with proper uh, protections, both for the patient and the healthcare workers. This is the future. Uh, oh, it's already here. Uh, it's 3D modeling, uh, incorporating hydroxy appetite uh, with polyether, ether ketone, called HA peak biocomposite to form this bone. You can look at the video and how this is done. Uh, it's a 3D print replacement bone. It can be made in any shape and size to fit the patient. Uh, it's a robust material, and when you replace the rib, it looks almost like a natural rib. It's radio loosened and you can uh, actually uh, there will be blood vessels that are growing within the composite and naturally be replaced by the bone. So uh, this may be the ideal prosthesis, but again the cost is an issue here. Um, if we have uh, indispensable funds to uh, help these patients or uh, it's covered by insurance, we can consider this. With that, the conclusion is challenging undertaking, so multidisciplinary team effort. Uh, the principles of chest wall resection must be always adhered. The resection and reconstruction, preferably done by different team of surgeon, is always a teamwork and that's the key. Free surgical margin must be achieved. There are various methods of reconstruction available in the market. Use what is available and feasible in your center. A chest wall resection and reconstruction can be performed safely during COVID-19 era, provided you follow the uh, protocols in your center. Advanced reconstruction methods are there, 3D reconstructions, hybrid OT with on-site 3D printing, bioprosthesis. So if it is available, by all means, please use and share the experience. We will want to experience that as well. With that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you. Nara and Dr. Padankiat, thank you for your presentation. It was wonderful.
Uh, we have a few questions which has come in. Uh, let me get started. Okay. All right. Um, okay. First question is uh, to uh, what type of analgesia do you use post trauma and who does it? The, normally we would use the epidural thoracic uh, uh, catheter. Um, we have a very good anesthesiologist that even they have a previous spine injury, he would be able to put in a um, epidural. But another form of the regional anesthesia that um, we have a team of anesthesiologists, some would put a steroid injection into the fracture site for the sake of the long-term pain control. It would, uh, they, they say it would stay for a couple of weeks in terms of pain control, but if we plan to go for the refixation, we would, of course, not doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever tried Excuse me? Have you ever tried Paravertebro? Uh, what do you say again, sorry? Have you ever tried paravertebral analgesia? Paravertebral, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, paravertebral. Can you hear me? Yes, but I'm not quite sure what you mean. Paro with the blow? Paravertebral. It's, it's a, another, another type of analgesia. It's an epidural has some complaints about it, lowers your blood pressure too much and it's too invasive. Do, do you mean, oh, paravertebral, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, um, we, we had, um, the, the other option that we use is paravertebral and the on cue pump. Mm. So we put in intra, uh, and intra, um, the, the inter, intercostal space catheter and uh, we, we gave them 24 hours of the infusion of the analgesia. Okay, right. Uh, let me keep switching between the both of you. Nara, question for you. Uh, yes. The question for you is a uh, good job, thank you. What do you, what do you, do you think that desmoid tumors can wait and watch or uh, they should be treated immediately? Uh. Yeah, uh, I just answered that. I think uh, wait and watch uh, for desmoid tumor can be done if the patient is asymptomatic uh, and if the tumor is uh, in an easy place to be observed with MRIs and, and uh, uh, they must give some form of oral therapy. Uh, but otherwise, if the patient is symptomatic and it's disturbing the quality of life, we recommend removal and uh, the removal must be planned appropriately and must be done radically because they are notorious for local recurrence. So uh, that's, that's what I think. Okay. Uh, get question for you. Uh, do you remove uh, removal of the ORIF plate after one year? Have you done it? Have you ever removed a plate which you put in? For both the speakers, you can answer. Uh, remove the plate? No, I don't remove any plates that I put in. Yeah. Yeah. Same. We, we, we don't remove the plate unless there's a problem. There's a, a reported problem of the plate fracture. So in the adolescent, highly athletic, and um, they, they, their chest move very, um, very much and it caused a plate fracture. That's a reported case. And um, there were there were a, a, a there were questions about the mini incision. Let let me show the screen. Um, I think the the slide missed out. So this is uh, what uh, what we call a MIPO, the minimally invasive place osteosynthesis. So you can uh, this is specially designed a a a, a right angle. Um, a, the, the screwdriver, so you can do that. But uh, the instrument is pretty and uh, quite expensive. So we adapt it by, um, um, this is what uh, the cancer that I did in, in the in the uh, rib, in the chest wall tumor. So we made a small incision and uh, we resect the rib 
And in the proximal and distal end, we make a um, stab incision like this. And uh, this, uh, the, 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 you see my pointer? This yep. is the pointer, yep. it shows the proximal fix at the distal fixation. And the other end is a proximal fixation here. So the gap is wide, but we were able to fix that with only one incision, three holes, each, each side. And I have a question for Dr. Nara too. For, uh, for the big chest wall resection and reconstruction using matrix rib, do you put any mesh to protect the lung from injury from, uh, to the plate or screw? Oh, okay. Uh... That, that, that I was expecting that question. We initially uh, uh, applied a composite mesh below the uh, uh, rib plates to protect the lung. Uh, but as we went on with our cases, we found that uh, the screw is exactly at the uh, inner uh, uh, plate of the rib that you're screwing in. So you don't have any screw jutting through the rib. And then uh, there's an uh, ALT free flap that is used to cover the uh, rib that is uh, reconstructed. So we found that there's no necessity to introduce another prosthesis in an already radically resected patient to uh, protect the lung. Uh, and, and so far in most of our cases, we don't use uh, composite mass except if it is involving the abdomen. Um, yeah, that's what we found. And this will be further addressed in our five-year uh, review. Another question for you, Nara. It says for upper sternal resection, including sternoclavicular joint, with or without resection of the clavicular head, what did you do with the clavicles? Okay. Uh, that is a mystery that I'm yet to find the answer. Uh, at the moment, we leave it afloat. I tried to fix the sternoclavicular joint once, but it gave away. Uh, there, there's not a solution that I've found, except there's some who have taken a tendon from the facial lata and screw it to the st sternal head and then uh, attach it to the remnant of the clavicle. But I, I have not tried all these uh, maneuvers yet. Um, it, it's a quite a complex uh, joint to fix. Um, maybe Dr. Paduket, you have any options for this? So what you can do is you can double roll your mesh. That is one place where mathematic relate mesh and the mesh combination comes in very handy. You can use that as your strut and support and double roll the mesh with your cement inside and construct only the area around the clavicle and the clavicular head. And the double folded mesh can be used for screwing and attachment and then you can carry on with the rest of the fixation. You can try that, yeah. That is a good uh, I saw your I saw your video, uh, Nara. You you showed a video where you had two ribs, and then you see when respiration, you see the muscle getting sucked in. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think you will be better off putting something else in between? Uh, in between the uh, rib. Yeah, about the rib. Uh, Above the rib, yeah, I mean, uh, we, as I said, we used to put the mesh in, in, in between, but we realized that having more prosthesis in these patients, uh, we're just increasing the risk of infection. Uh, and and we, we found that without the mesh, they do equally well, and less risk of seroma and uh, less morbidity postoperatively. So we made away with the mesh in one of the patients uh, because of the infective status and he did pretty well and we tried on for the subsequent cases and, and they did equally well. So we decided not to put any more composite mesh uh, with a good ALT, good chunk of ALT free flap uh, being on, laying on the reconstructed rate. So that's the reason why we made away with the composite mesh. Just tap onto that, in your experience dealing with infected meshes, do you any, sometimes use biological meshes? Uh, no, uh, we have not used any biological meshes. Uh, in, in the infected meshes that, like for example, in the patient that I showed you earlier, the abdominal uh, part of the, uh, the lower end of the tri-junction that got infected, we just kept the mesh, we did some wet dressing around it, 
And at the end of two weeks, we resected the composite mesh around the infected area and replaced it with SSG and patient did quite well. So we never found a use to replace it with biological meshes at the moment. And it's expensive, uh, more than the composite. Yeah. To, add, to add to your point, yes, that's right. Biological meshes are expensive. At, the, at this point in time, we have only one, I think, which can worth its time. It's called Permacol. A small piece of it costs something like two thousand dollars, and I use it all the time. So I know. And if you want to use that size of mesh in my patients, <laughs> it's gone. It is quite expensive, but if it is an option to use, yes. and if you have the money to use, it is a very good cover because it is infection resistant, and is also radiation resistant. So it does help in big protection. You may keep that in mind. Uh, I think we're running out of time. All right, we, this is the last question I'm going to ask you. My question is a three-year-old having a peanut involving ribs one to three. We are planning to go for a resection. We don't have matrix ribs here. This is from Dr. Kadi, I think, from Bangladesh. Sorry, we may use polypropylene mesh. What do you think is best, keeping in mind the growth and development of the child? So he's got a peanut involving the ribs one, one to three. And he doesn't have matrix rib. What okay. So, I mean, um, uh, I haven't seen the scans and the recon pictures, but if it's only involving three ribs, I would say just go for primary closure. Don't recon anything. Just uh, recite the three ribs and uh, close the muscle and skin and let, let the child grow. You'll, she'll mm -hmm. overcome it. Absolutely. I would agree with that too. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we've just run out of time. Gentlemen, I think it was wonderful. Had a great discussion. Okay. And uh, Nara and Padankep. Stay safe, stay well, and uh, thank, all you. Of you. thank you. You too. Yeah, all of you people in ASEAN, we see you next week. Okay, take care. Bye bye. Good night. Bye. Ciao.